But uh, I like to do that because that, when it has so many places marked on there, again, it's like being there, get overwhelmed with all the places and lose a sense of the hole that I'm looking for. Mm -hmm. That's just yeah. my, no. my <laughs> response, but uh, yeah, I do That's a lot of circul circling, <laughs> maybe in more ways than one. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, oh, start again, Nancy, please. Okay. On the next day, when they came down from the mountain, a large crowd met him. There was a man in the crowd who cried out, Teacher, I beg you, look at my son. He is my only child. Have you noticed that the again and again and again we uh, have only children? The only son of the widow of Maine? that died, the only daughter of the centurion. It's a interesting. And I think if we remember that in Jewish tradition anyway, a an only our firstborn was exceedingly important. Because in earlier tradition that's how you lived on, because there was no life beyond this life. And so, and only, well, again, think of how, you know people who have an only child. What, it's almost a stereotype. What is, what is the stereotype about an only child? Pampered. Pampered, spoiled. So nice for okay. Doted on. Mm -hmm. I will always remember a one of the professors at Iowa State whose uh, parents and she were brought up Catholic. She was the only child. Brilliant. Very attractive. Some would say beautiful. Uh, I mean, she had it all. So they were, I mean, everything went into her. They allowed her or provided for her a trip to France, uh, to study in France and so on. <clears throat> well, young person that she was, the uh, trolley car, the street car <coughs> had taken off, but she ran to jump on it, missed, and the trolley car went over and laid right here and cut her off. So and there was no way to do anything about it. So she had a prosthesis, but it, she was never free of pain. Her parents were embittered, left the church, and that was one of the angriest women I have ever seen. Boy, if you, anything could just, she would explode. That, <clears throat> I've always felt so, so bad about that family. And I've thought of what uh, I think we don't think of is very much a part of Christian tradition. I taught this in medieval literature, and it certainly comes through in runs in uh, Shakespeare. Um, the idea that you can make another person into a god, a goddess. Um, Notice what uh, the parents of Romeo say when they are reprimanded for not uh, having uh, control and guidance for Romeo. Was he an only child? Pardon? Was he an only child, Romeo? Uh, I don't know, but he, the state reprimands his parents because they are responsible, parents were responsible 
until a young person was 20. If, if somebody did something under the age of 20, it was the parents who were responsible. Now, how about Othello, who killed his wife? He said, I loved not wisely, but too well. He made her into a goddess. goddess. I loved not wisely, but too well. And that was the, that's, that's a Christian Catholic tradition. If you make anything or anybody into your God that is not God, that's both destructive of that and self-destructive. I think we've lost that sense. I think it's a shame. We've talked about sometimes, why didn't the church keep all of this teaching? How in the world are you going to teach young people that unless it's a lifelong teaching and unless that it's a part of the culture? I'm reminded of a statement I read and I thought, that's curious. <laughs> a writer was writing about Ireland. He was Irish in the United States, both. He said, an atheist in Ireland is more Catholic than a devout Catholic in the United States. <laughs> Do you know what he was talking about? You grow up with it within a culture and you tend, you inevitably, you reflect that culture. You have the biases and the prejudices and so on of that culture. Ah, okay, Nancy, uh, start again at 37. On the next day, when they came down from the mountain, a large crowd met him. There was a man in the crowd who cried out, Teacher, I beg you, look at my son. He is my only child. For a spirit seizes him, and he suddenly screams, and it convulses him <coughs> until he foams at the mouth. It releases him only with difficulty, wearing him out. I begged your disciples to cast it out, but they could not. Jesus said in reply, O oh, faithless and perverse generation, how long will I be with you and endure you? Bring your son here. As he was coming forward, the demon threw him to the ground in a convulsion. But Jesus rebuked the unclean spirit, healed the boy, and returned him to his father. And all were astonished by the majesty of God. Uh -huh. Okay, the whole bunch of things I want to call to attention here. Uh, first of all, the question is, why couldn't the disciples heal the child? Assuming they didn't believe enough, they didn't have enough faith. Faithless. Uh, Matthew, the man says, Lord, I believe, help my unbelief. Jesus said, he can be healed if you, be, if you have faith. Remember the emphasis on faith all the way through? It, your faith has healed you. Your faith has saved you. Notice? Mm -hmm. And so Matthew makes it a little bit more explicit, but it's explicit here. Faithless generation, right? So I think it's awfully important that we remember the power of God is shown through those who have faith. Okay, notice, did they then compliment uh, Jesus directly? What, what astonished them? Pardon? The majesty of God. Ah. Are they saying, are they calling Jesus God here? Not really. No. What is it? Uh, it's in the Sermon on the Mount. Do your good works for what purpose? 
obviously for the good of others, but to give glory to God. In other words, do you get the credit? Yes and no, but what's the point? That you are expressing. Well, okay, uh, to look at, look at this whole section we've been through. The question I've been giving you was, who is Jesus, right? I've said it over and over because that's the questions that were raised. At the same time, we're getting who is Jesus, we're getting what is, the, what is a disciple of Jesus to look like? How is a disciple to act like Jesus? Right? And so that whole section uh, of the Galilean ministry uh, it intensifies toward the end of it with, and I'll, I hope I'll make sense of why I said sad conclusion. Uh, but uh, yeah, who is Jesus? Okay, go ahead, Nancy. Well, they were all amazed at his every deed. He said to his disciples. By the way, notice. So, although it's the majesty of God that <coughs> recognized the person who was showing them that majesty. Go ahead. Pay attention to what I am telling you. Boy. Now, uh, is anybody in your family you had to get attention? I think I've talked before about uh, Ruth, amazing, and to me, very admirable ability to focus. If she is doing something and is really focused on it, she can answer me, she can look at me and say it, and uh, I'll look in my direction and say it, I not know that we've had that conversation. Mm -hmm. So if it's something I really needed to listen to, and it, uh, I'll say, honey, I need your attention. <laughs> On occasion, I've said, honey, look at me. <laughs> <laughs> because, I mean, when she's involved in something, that is, it, I've always been amazed at her focus and how specific it can be. I, I, she's the only person in the world I've ever known who could walk through an area of clover and reach down and pick up woolly clovers. That doesn't make any sense to me. I can't see that way. I can't. I can't even find them when I'm looking for them. <laughs> <laughs> uh, a reminder just as no two memories are alike, no two people see the same thing or the same way. And sometimes we get upset with somebody because they won't see what we saw. Can't expect that. We can't. Okay, Nancy, uh, go ahead. Notice, he says, let these words sink into let, let me have your attention. Listen, okay. The Son of Man is to be handed over to men. But they did not understand the saying. Its meaning was hidden from them, so that they should not mm -hmm. understand it. And they were afraid to ask him about this saying. Okay. This is more than they can comprehend. First of all, notice he's using the name that he's real, Son of Man is, is the name he wants them to know and remember. Now, who is the Son of Man? That's a different question. They don't fully understand that yet. But the idea that a Messiah would be handed over to men, i.e., handed over to men indicates something of 
what's going to happen. Watch as we get into this section now. Go ahead. An argument arose among the disciples about which of them was the greatest. Okay. Now remember, three of them have been on the Mount of Transfiguration with Jesus. And by the way, it's one of those involved because in uh, Matthew's account, John says, may I sit, uh, uh, we have, my brother and I want to sit one on your right, one on your left hand when you come in your kingdom. Which wasn't that their mother, <coughs> but, <coughs> thought it was their mother who said uh, that. Uh, Mark also, that Mark, Luke, and John have this, and uh, you may be right, uh, in one it's the mother asked for it, mm -hmm. in the other it's the disciple. Okay. Jesus realized the intention of their hearts and took a child and placed it by his side and said to them, whoever receives this, this child in my name receives me and whoever receives me receives the one who sent me. For the one who is least among you, uh, is least among all of you, is the one who is the greatest. And boy, it's, I notice that's been true from the beginning. What was said of Mary? The Lord has come to lowly handmaid. Yeah, lowly. And yes, John. Well, I have a question. He, he says, pay attention to what I'm telling you. But they, they don't understand. It says the meaning was hidden from them. So in the next one, he knows what they're thinking. He says he realized the mention in their hearts. So he must have also known they really didn't understand what he said when he said, pay attention to me. Correct. You're quite right. But it just goes on. I mean, well, uh, <laughs> uh, teacher, why, says, you have to say something eight or ten times before it's going to connect. <laughs> and really, the disciples had to wait till Pentecost. Yeah, right. that's the reason I said as we began, the Holy Spirit had a lot of work to do. Yeah, because he's already told them at least once before when, when Peter became the rock. <coughs> because it was right after that when... He's right. Peter down. And he's going to say it again and again. I don't know whether it's eight or ten times. But <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah. Well, can't we all recognize this statement? Is that what my parents meant? <laughs> uh, yeah. It's, it's a process. Just because somebody explains something <coughs> or says something doesn't mean we get it. I think one of the hardest things uh, about teaching, writing, is the difference between self-expression and communication. If I say whatever, you know, whatever comes to me, that's self-expression. And when we simply express ourselves, we're actually laying ourselves open so that people can see us in our vulnerability. Uh, I got in trouble at Iowa State once. Well, more than once, but uh, on this occasion, uh, I gave this assignment first first or second day, probably second day of class, first or second, I said, I want in at least uh, 20, 50 words, describe the place you're living at right now. Okay, I took that, it was about half a page for many of them. I took that material, didn't comment on anything about their writing or punctuation, anything, I told them what they were like. 
And uh, for instance, I said to one young man, uh, you're very close to your mother. He said, my dad is dead. Uh, I remember why I said this to a young woman. I said, uh, you're not involved in uh, feminist movement at all. In fact, probably uh, do not approve of it. She said, how did you know that? I said, a feminist would never say I live in a two-man room. Got it? And that's the kind of thing I told one young woman, uh, you like Victorian rugs and uh, uh, ornate jewelry and so on. She was furious with me. And one of the students went to the chair of freshman English and said, Dr. McCulley is delving into my personal life. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, he, he came to me and said, John, what are you doing? <laughs> and I told him, and he started laughing. He said, it's a wonderful exercise, but I wouldn't do that again. <laughs> okay, what they would do, they had no audience, they had no purpose. Right? So they would just describe it. And whatever words came to them. Well, if you don't have an audience in mind, you're not communicating. And if you don't have a purpose in mind, you're not really communicating. We do a lot of expressing ourselves. So, yeah. Here, Jesus is trying to communicate. He's not just expressing himself, though he does that also. So it, it, he's doing both. <coughs> go ahead, uh, uh, Before I go, I want to underscore once again. Who is the greatest in the kingdom? The least. The least. Boy. Have we got things upside down, huh? I really wonder how many of us believe that, grasp it. In other words, has the Holy Spirit been able to get? John, we've heard that again and again and again. Really? How many of us have that as a part of our lives, part of our thinking? Don't answer. <laughs> but. Uh, well, I'll answer it this way. Okay. Sometimes, but not enough. Well said. Well said. Because there are times, can I say there are moments of enlightenment? <laughs> yeah. Well, and, you know, we're... An awareness. We get busy, and we don't always have the time to stop and do whatever it is, even if it's just to help that person on the side of the road. Yeah, that's right. Uh, this is one of the things that uh, I have I have a hard time passing up somebody for instance who's walking in the cold and yet uh, there's a sense of am I intruding well and in today's age especially if it's a female I've had that same thought. Well, one of the things uh, during that really, that coldest day of the year when we had water below, I saw a young man walking from, it, it was either, I uh, probably Walmart because he was that street that goes and they didn't turn into it. And I said, Ruth, we need to stop and see about him. And his comment was, Oh, he's probably not going far. I said, I have to go back. I went back. And by the way, I don't think her statement was unusual. Who would walk out in that, right? Mm -hmm. This young man from North Carolina, I'm sorry, from Virginia, 
who had been in Ames just a short time. It was the beginning of uh, the, I guess it, he had come here to be ready for the second semester, I guess was what it was. So this was what, three months ago maybe? He had on only a hoodie and a shirt. And I said, would you like a ride? He said, well, I, I live out on campus. I said, get in. <laughs> he did not, he said, I didn't realize you could have weather like this. <laughs> Welcome to Iowa. <laughs> yeah. And uh, that's not the first person. I've uh, <coughs> like that. One one from China, one from Japan. We uh, we found news walking in the blizzard. So yeah, we sometimes recognize it. Uh, who is my neighbor, by the way? Especially the ones who. Who need, who need us. Remember, Jesus said, who was neighbor to the man who fell among thieves? The guy said, I suppose, the Samaritan. <laughs> Hesitantly, I gather. <laughs> okay, go ahead, Nathan. Then John said in reply, Master, we saw someone casting out demons in your name, and we tried to prevent him because he does not follow in our company. Jesus said to him, Do not prevent him, for whoever is not against you is for you. What's the key uh, phrase in that little episode? In his name. Exactly. In your name. Uh, in Acts, uh, there's a, a story about a magician who wants to buy, well, look at Acts chapter 8. Acts chapter 8. <coughs> First, we'll start with verse 14. about to say R.J. and you said who me? <laughs> <laughs> now when the apostles in Jerusalem heard that Samaria had accepted the word of God, they sent them Peter and John, who went down and prayed for them, that they, and that they might receive the Holy Spirit, for it had not yet fallen upon any of them. They had only been baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. Then they laid hands upon them, and they received the Holy Spirit. When Simon saw that the Spirit was confer, uh, conferred by, the, by laying the hands up on the, on, of the apostles, Excuse me, let me sir, try that again. Uh, well, uh, verse 9 says, Simon had previously <clears throat> practiced magic in that city. Now go ahead. Okay. When Simon saw that the Spirit was conferred, by the laying of the, of, by the laying on, by the laying on of the apostles' hands, he offered them money, and said, "Give me the power too, so that anyone upon whom I lay my hands may receive the Holy Spirit." <laughs> but Peter said to him, "May your money perish with you, because you thought that you could buy the gift of God with money." Okay. Notice, it's, uh, keep reading, there's more. You have no share or lot in this matter, for your heart is not upright before God. Okay, your heart is not upright before God. Your faith has saved you. The action, I don't care if we pray, 
day and night. I don't care what we do or what it, that's not it. Well, what did Paul say about it in 1 Corinthians 13? I can, oh, you give your body to be burned. <clears throat> Offer yourself in sacrifice as a human sacrifice. You don't have love. What? It is not. So clanging. Yeah. Clanging gong. It's what I think. Though I speak with the tongues of men and of angels. What do you mean by tongues? What is your mother tongue? Different okay. Languages. Different languages. Different languages. The la Though I speak with the language of all people and of the angels themselves, and I do not have love. <clears throat> okay, faith and love. Well, what does he say? Faith, hope, and love, but the greatest of these is love. Okay, but hey, uh, notice, don't, don't underestimate the power of faith. <laughs> okay, let's go ahead, Nancy. Uh, maybe before we begin, this is where I ought to uh, talk about this, because we're starting on a new section. Up to this point, from chapter 4, 14, we've been going through uh, the material of Jesus teaching. <coughs> it's called the Galilean ministry. He's been teaching in Galilee. Now, notice, that is not an area where you're going to find a lot of the religious authorities, because that's not the Jewish area. The Jewish area is Judea. Jerusalem is the center. And uh, so, now, why do I say a sad conclusion? Jesus has been teaching who he is. Did they get it? No. That's what I mean by the sad conclusion. Even the <clears throat> crowning passage that shows they don't get it is uh, the request. Uh, and by the way, you're going to keep hearing that kind of thing. Again, let me show to the, go to the uh, Acts again. Remember, uh, Luke wrote both uh, Luke and Acts. Uh, and this is, <coughs> excuse me, in uh, yeah, chapter 1 of Acts. Uh, okay, R.J., you got it? Yeah. What, what are the, what verse? Uh, chapter 1, verse 6. When, when they had gathered together, they asked him, Lord, are you at this time going to restore the kingdom of Israel? He answered them, It is not for you to know the times or the seasons that the Father has established by his own authority. But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, throughout Judea and Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. Do you think they understood the latter part of that? No. Can you believe they're still saying, uh, is now the time you're going to restore your kingdom? And by the way, restore the kingdom does not mean Kingdom of heaven. <coughs> kingdom of but John, if he came back today, how many of us would really understand what he'd be telling us? What did we just talk about? That in, at times we remember something, but exactly. <coughs> I, I, I think you're absolutely right. Do we get it yet? Uh, um, 
One of the things I think about, especially as I watch my grandchildren, every generation almost has to start over. And how do you get somebody started when there's so much distraction from every direction, every possible? <laughs> no wonder so much has been lost. No kidding. <laughs> and I really appreciate something one of my grandsons said. He said, Grandpa, I wish I knew as much as you know. And I said to him, Paul, if you start now, you will know more than I know, because I started later than your age. And, yeah, but we, we tend to say, mm, I want it instantly, or maybe even yesterday. <laughs> uh, it's a long, hard slog. Is it exciting? Sometimes. Is it drudgery? Sometimes. Uh, but simply gaining the insight and understanding, do I have it yet? I just said it don't, didn't I? <laughs> yeah. Okay. I'll go ahead, Nancy. Start now with, from now on, we're going to be looking at Jesus' journey toward Jerusalem. And as he's already said, that's a journey toward the crucifixion. Okay. When the days of his being taken up were fulfilled, he resolutely determined to journey to, to Jerusalem. And he sent messengers ahead of him. Okay. By the way, when the days drew near for what? Passover. Pardon? Passover. Okay. And when <coughs> they, what did, okay. I'm sorry. Uh, read again. When the days of his being taken up were fulfilled. Oh, when the days for his being... What? Taken up. What, is, what? Taken up. What is that? His death and resurrection. And... Taken up? Yeah. Oh. This is going back to heaven. Ascension. Yeah. Oh, that's the word, yeah. It's a good word. <laughs> <laughs> Remember those words that we can just go over and they, okay. At the, at the Transfiguration, what <clears throat> do he and Moses and Elijah discuss? It's coming back. His exodus. Remember? <coughs> His exodus. And now he speaks of being taken up. Let's, let's go back to that because that, uh, that it can so easily uh, slip by us. I'm uh, going back to chapter 9, verse 30. Okay, RJ, I've been picking on you. Go ahead, 9.30. And behold, two men were conversing with him, Moses and Elijah, who appeared in glory and spoke of his exodus. Ah, see what I mean? Yeah. And in glory, mm -hmm. smoke. Yeah, wow. exactly. His exodus. What is an exodus? Leaving. But it's more than that. A freeing. Oh. What'd you say? A freeing. Free? Freeing, yeah. And notice at the Exodus, what did God do for his people? He freed them from slavery. He freed them from slavery. He ransomed them. <clears throat> ransomed them. He. Not to, to their 
a new land. Okay, okay. he was leading them to the land of promise. Gave them Prom the rules. Okay, but uh, that is not emphasized there. Uh, uh, what I'm talking about is the language that you have talking about the Exodus itself. Doesn't mention the Ten Commandments there. So I half joke when you say this, what is he being freed from? Us thick headed mortals? <laughs> and from the limitations of earthly life, and uh, we could probably say many other things. Uh, because he says, if I do not go, the Holy Spirit cannot come. And notice, Jesus was one human being who could be in one place at one time. Is that true of the Holy Spirit? No. No. So freed from the limitations of earthly life, uh, though indeed, <laughs> Uh, freed from struggling with us mortals? I don't know. Doesn't God continue to do that? <laughs> uh, but, uh, yeah, watch those words that can, we can just go right over them. In fact, some translations don't even use the Exodus. They use departure or something of the sort. And that's the reason. Remember what St. Augustine said? If you, can't, if you don't read the, additional, the original language, what do you do if you really want to understand the material? Read all the translations you can. Get as many translations as you can and compare. And I have really <clears throat> found that truth. Uh, boy, when I did that, it really became clear the word uh, nefesh in the, the, I'm sorry, ruach in uh, the Old Testament. Okay, God, uh, in the beginning when God created the heavens and the earth, mm -hmm. okay, and the Spirit of God was hovering over the face of the earth. That's one translation. You remember another one? A great wind from God was blowing over the surface of the waters. And still another, God blew his breath over the waters. Which is correct? All of them. Yeah, it's another yes. <laughs> uh, so it, that's, I, I'm trying to illustrate what St. Augustine means by Okay, read as many as translations as you can find to do that. Okay, Nancy? Um, where do you want me uh, to start? Why don't you start again at 51? <clears throat> when the days of his being taken up were fulfilled, he resolutely determined to journey to Jerusalem, and he sent messengers ahead of him. On the way, they entered a Samaritan village to prepare for his reception there. I had, by the way, I would never noticed that how often Jesus sends messengers ahead of him. But notice what he did and, uh, when uh, getting ready to celebrate the Passover. Mm. Yes. He sent disciples to prepare. Is this at all, I'm again stretching, possibly getting out of the weeds, but is this any bit of foreshadowing, if you want to call that, about as we get into revelations about how there will be the angels coming before he comes? Is there any connection with that? Uh, I would say... Was it in here we were talking recently about uh, the uh, man, the, the flood, the man being caught in a flood and he's on the housetop? Yeah. Wasn't that in here? Right, yeah. Okay, remind us of, of that, RJ. Well, I think Kevin told oh, us. Oh, Kevin? That's right, remind <laughs> us of that, Kevin. Oh, recall Yeah. <laughs> 
a flood in a man, in this case, trapped on the roof of his house. And some rescuers came by in a boat and offered to take him off. He said, no, I'm waiting for God to help me. And this happened two or three times. And finally the house went under and the man drowned. And he gets to heaven and he said, God, I kept waiting for you to come and save me. And you never did. And God said, I sent three people to help you. <laughs> okay. Uh, <coughs> it's an angel. By definition. What's the messenger. word? Messenger. messenger. And so, yeah, the word angel, the word angel is not a native English word. Uh, so, when we uh, carry the word over, as we do with Satan, angel, and so on, um, then we, we lose the original meaning often. <coughs> and so, I think that's an example. We forget that, as St. Augustine said again, Boy, what would I do without him? Uh, the word angel does not deal with the being. It deals, it, that uh, deals with the function. So angel is not a being. Angel is a function. Okay, Nancy? On the way, they entered a Samaritan village to prepare for his reception there, but they would not welcome him because the destination of his journey was Jerusalem. And do you understand why they would not welcome him when his destination was Jerusalem? What was the relationship between Jews and Samaritans? <coughs> Jews or. despised yes. Samaritans. And it worked both ways. Uh, the Samaritans and the Jews had been at war, uh, came to be at war, when the Jews returned from Babylonian captivity. And the Samaritans would uh, uh, vandalize what the, what the Jews had built during the day. And so there was, there was that, but there was also something maybe something maybe even stronger. The Samaritans were a mixture of Jews and non-Jews. The Jews that had remained in the land and the people brought in. And so their language and their religion were a mixture and uh, Notice how uh, the Samaritan woman said, our fathers say, and your fathers say. So, uh, Well, and I'm sorry, I feel no. like I'm talking a lot today, but it, I find I'm it glad. interesting because you, you had just <laughs> talked about tongues and about how an Irish atheist is more Catholic than, a, in some, that fits very well with what you just talked about with Samaria. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Uh, because they, uh, yeah, they were good. In some ways, they regarded Samaritans as worse than Gentiles because they are mongrels. It's the idea. Uh, so, I'm thinking about... Uh, Interracial marriage in the South. Oh my word. In the past, do you know there was a law until 19, what, 1970 maybe? Uh, that uh, interracial couple could be jailed. It was against the law. And so, oh my goodness. So, uh, that is always connected with me, with Samaritan and uh, Jew, because of course, growing up in Mississippi, I saw, I grew up seeing that discrimination. Okay, Nancy. When the disciples, James and John, saw this, they asked, 
Lord, do you want us to call down fire from heaven to consume them? Ah, okay, let's... Uh, if, I'm going to turn real quickly to this. I'm going to 2 Kings chapter 1. And I'll just read this uh, briefly. Um, well, if I can find it now. Uh, let's see. Uh, oh, okay. It's verse 9. Then the king, and by the way, uh, there's an attempt to arrest Elijah. So uh, the king is trying to, well, stop him. And uh, then the king sent to him a captain of 50 men with his 50. He went up to Elijah who was sitting on the top of a hill and said to him, O man of God, the king says, come down. But Elijah answered the captain of 50. Listen, if I am a man of God, let fire come down from heaven and consume you and your 50. Then fire came down from heaven and consumed them. So, if I am a man of God, now, what have the uh, disciples come to understand about Jesus that would enable them to make that kind of statement? He's a man of God. They have come to understand that Jesus is a man of God. Is Elijah divine? Obviously not. By the way, Elijah was taken up though. Was he not? Mm -hmm. And so, hey, you can see how much teaching Jesus had to do. There were a lot of corrections that had to come. <clears throat> okay, go ahead, Nancy. Uh, Jesus turned and rebuked them, and they journeyed to another village. Ah, notice, is Jesus the one who's going to call down fire? Not here, not here. Go ahead. As they were proceeding on their journey, someone said to him, I will follow you wherever you go. Oh my goodness. Uh, yeah, go ahead. Jesus answered him, Foxes have dens, and birds of the sky have nests, but the Son of Man has nowhere to rest his head. And to another he said, Follow me. But he replied, Lord, let me go first and bury my father. But he answered him, Let the dead bury their dead. But you go and proclaim the kingdom of God. Okay, I want you I'd like you all to go to First <laughs> Kings now. First Kings. First Kings chapter nineteen. That's not the, but the, I just looked at that. I must have written down the wrong thing. Okay, let's see. Sorry, I've written down the wrong thing. The passage I'm referring to is God's call of Elijah. And uh, Elijah says, let me go back and bury my parents. And so he went back and took a sacrifice and offered it. And so this is, this is a similar statement. I'm <clears throat> 
wait a minute. Maybe it's Second Kings. I'll bet it's Second Kings. That would make better sense. Second Kings. Okay. Let me try that. Uh, that would make sense. Okay. No. I'm sorry. So well, my Bible has a reference to... What first, is the reference? First Kings um, 1920. I thought that's where I went. Yeah. I'm first Kings 19. <coughs> Don't know why I couldn't see it. <coughs> but uh, First Kings... Carl of Alicia. Yeah. Because, ah, yeah. that's the problem. I got the two prophets reversed. Okay, First Kings, start with uh, 19. Uh, Mary, you got it, so <laughs> go ahead. You, Elijah set out and came upon Elisha, son of Shaphat, as he was plowing with twelve yoke of oxen. He was following the twelve. Elijah went over to him and threw his cloak on him. Elisha left the oxen, ran after Elijah, and said, Please, let me kiss my father and mother goodbye, and I will follow you. Elijah answered, Go back. What have I done to you? Elisha left him, and taking the yoke of oxen, slaughtered them. He used the plowing equipment for fuel to boil their flesh, and gave it to the people to eat. Then he left and followed Elijah to serve him. Okay, I had that pretty muzzled, muzzled at night. Uh, so, thank you, Mary. That's exactly the passage that I was thinking of, even though I had not read it. First Kings. It's First Kings chapter 19. Uh, and uh, verse 19, was it? First 19 and 20. Yeah, 19. Mm -hmm. uh, following. Okay, now I'd like to go back and read the passage in Luke again, Nancy. Uh, Verse 57. Okay, go ahead. As they were proceeding on their journey, someone said to him, I will follow you wherever you go. Now notice, this was not a call to someone. But this is a, okay, go ahead. Jesus answered him, Foxes have dens, and the birds of the sky have nests. But the Son of Man has nowhere to rest his head. All right. Notice, what is he saying? If you follow me... It's going to be hard. There's, there's no rest. There is no rest. Okay, go ahead. And to another he said, follow me. But he replied, Lord, let me go first and bury my father. By the way, that's, that's, not, a, that's not a casual statement. Uh, what do we still say about burying the dead? What do, what is that? One of the corporal works of mercy. Pardon? No. One of the, one of the work. Yeah, one of the corporal works of mercy. Feed the hungry. Bury the dead. Okay, and bury the dead. <clears throat> uh, by the way, that that uh, seventh. That's the seventh one, and it comes from. The book of Tobit. Uh, Tobias was going about burying the dead. So burying the dead, it comes from Deuteronomy as well. Burying the dead was a serious obligation. Do you know why? Why was that such a big deal? Respect for God's creation. Respect for God's creation. Now, what did the people around them do? Say, the Romans, what did they do? Probably burned them. Yeah. And uh, that's the reason in the early church, cremation was forbidden. Notice that's not true anymore because we don't have the association with uh, <coughs> paganism in that sense. Uh, cremation does not have that association for us. So, uh, burying the dead was very important. Go ahead, Nancy. So, did, 
he really mean? You no, know, you you can't bury your father. Okay, go yeah. ahead. Go ahead and read. It. Well, uh, now I'm coming on them. But he answered him, "Let the dead bury their dead, but you go and proclaim the kingdom of God." Okay, I I let those who do not have the life that I give you bury those who die. Uh, but what is he saying about a follower of Jesus? What is he saying about his followers? They don't die. Mm -hmm. mm, yes, but not specifically here. Uh, the, in terms of dead bury the dead, yes. Uh, so implicitly, uh, you're not dead, you're alive. But what is he saying uh, about a follower of Jesus when he says, let the dead bury the dead and the foxes have holes and so forth? You kind of have blinders on. Uh, you have a one mission and that's, you're supposed to focus on that okay. mission. Okay, you have a mission. And that's what you're to do. Uh, you're to leave father mother, the one who loves father and mother more than me is not worthy of me. Worthy of me. Following Jesus is some sacrifice. Well, <coughs> sacrifice. Yeah, yeah. And, Give up and some things. Yeah. You have to give up some things. But that's, it means different things depending on what your vocation is. That is correct. <clears throat> that is correct. But the disciples, remember, the, tw the twelve become apostles, and the church refers to those twelve as the first bishops. bishops. So, what does a bishop to this day have to do? Does he live with his parents? No. He goes where he's assigned. He goes where he's assigned. And is that necessarily permanent? No. No. And, okay. Did you know that uh, deacons are not promised at all that they have no promise of going back to the parish they came from. Did you know that? Mm -hmm. <clears throat> the bishop, or archbishop in our case, has the right and the power to assign them. Uh, and he could now. We were told the bishop will take into consideration your informant. But I could have been assigned to St. Cecilia, St. Thomas, and for a while I was part-time there. St. Peter and Paul, Jewel, Story City, you know, I'm naming the places, even um, there was discussion, would it be inappropriate to, uh, would it be an undue hardship to assign somebody uh, an hour's drive away? And the statement was probably not in most cases. So an hour's drive away from here is beyond the morn. But not to Dubuque. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I had a friend when I was in Boone that was uh, in the process of thinking about becoming a deacon. I eventually wrote his letter for recommendation. But uh, he wanted to wait until they found out who the new bishop was, whether he would do obedience to the bishop or not. Well, he'd have to wait a long time. <laughs> well, this was this was before Nicholas. Ah. Uh, so it was between uh, Mel Cardinal. Yeah. And, so we were without a bishop for a while, and he didn't. That's want right. It. 
That's right. Uh, well, because uh, you pledge your, your obedience to the bishop. That's correct. And uh, so, by the way, do you know that a bishop can also remove the faculties from a deacon if that deacon is disobedient to his pastor? Pardon? I can see where he could do that. Well, <laughs> yes, he, and I know somebody who was threatened. Mm -hmm. And so, yeah, when you become a deacon, even more as a priest, okay, again, priest even more than a bishop has moved around. Mm -hmm. yeah. And so, going back to this, <clears throat> yeah, you leave your father and mother. Are there many deacons in this era that are not in their home parish? I know there are some. I don't know how many, but I know that there are some. Uh, I'm not sure why uh, the Archbishop has uh, allowed us to have so many deacons, except that all of us are busy. Uh, we are a bigger parish. And, uh, by the way, according to all accounts, a very difficult parish to pastor. <laughs> <laughs> uh, during, my, during the CW retreat this weekend, I was talking to some of the deacons, uh, Deacon Stan uh, and Deacon Mark uh, Dolash. Yes. And there was, we actually were on this discussion, and they brought up the name, I don't remember the name, but there's somebody who was from one of the parishes out that way that has actually been asked to go somewhere else to... Yeah. So it does that, happen. Uh, the, good. Thanks for our specific reference, because I know there are some, but I don't know uh, who and how many. But, uh, yeah, I, I think that that may sound harsh to us, but when we then take it to the reality of, of what is asked, uh, is it? Uh, I think perhaps it sounds so blunt here. It's such a stark statement. But the statement stands. I think there are a lot of chiefs and not enough Indians in Ames, Iowa. <laughs> <laughs> oh, no. uh, well, uh, <clears throat> interesting, interesting that I always think of this, Archbishop Hannes on one occasion said, people are complaining that there aren't uh, enough clergy in the diocese and comparing it to the 1960s. And he said, at this moment, and that was a number of years ago, we have exactly the same number of clergy that we had in 1967. The difference is that we have deacons now. I thought, I think all of us were kind of shocked <laughs> that he put it that way. Okay, go ahead. Well, John, oh, I, so, going back to the readings, because this, I, I, I think this tied in, today's gospel reading, I think ties in very nicely with this. I've got it pulled up. Can I read it? Sure. Do have no Absolutely. Words? Okay, so it, it, came from, it comes from Mark chapter 10, uh, 28 to 31. Uh, Peter began to say to Jesus, We have given up everything to follow you. Jesus said, Amen. I say to you, there is no one who has given up house or brothers or sisters or mother or father or children or lands for my sake and, has, and for, the, for the sake of the gospel who will not receive a hundred times more now in, the pre in this present age. Houses and brothers and sisters and mothers and children and lands with persecutions and eternal life in the age to come. But many, but many that are first will be last and the last will be first. Thank you, Brad. I should have pulled it up myself. Very good. That's a perfect response, isn't it? 
And, and it, it reminds me because you say, and I just let it go there, but um, I remember, and I don't know, don't remember the reason, so I'm glad, I'm glad it happened today. It talks about brothers and sisters and mothers and fathers, but in the second half it doesn't mention the father. And you said why? And I don't remember why, because I haven't heard it eight times yet, so I don't <laughs> <laughs> keep repeating. Because Jesus, uh, the, the father, is God. Okay, that's what I was assuming today. Okay. And uh, remember, uh, who are my brothers and sisters, my mother? Those who believe. So, okay, we're all family. Again, we say it, but does it feel like it? Do we exercise it? Um, I have a, a nephew who is a Benedictine uh, monk, priest, and when he uh, professed his vows to become a monk, he gave up his family, his his earthly family, because the monks there at the Abbey are his family now. He still can come to family events, but not if they interfere with anything major going on at the Abbey. That's right. And that is, that is the tradition. Good. That's, a, again, a perfect example. And uh, indeed, those who live a cloistered life particularly Leave everything. So, yeah. And we don't want to do that nowadays. Uh, I will never forget one of the m major things that I, major attitudes that I felt like I was working against when I was director of vocations awareness was parents did not want their children to be uh, priests or sisters. Uh, we had a young woman in this parish who begged and cried and so on. Her parents said, absolutely not. We had a young woman who uh, struggled with becoming a sister for some time. And her brother said, no way, it's your responsibility to take care of our parents. She was an only daughter. Okay? And her brother said, it's your responsibility to take care of our parents. Interesting. Uh, so she never became a sister. Again, uh, the, I talked, interviewed a group of young priests and out of the group of them, and there must have been six or so, one, one of them had parents who were excited or pleased their son was going to become a priest. What was the thing that they heard? We want grandchildren. And they should, should have had more children. Hmm. I think we need to start listening to the Holy Spirit, or Jay. Yeah. yeah. Boy, today I feel like I'm thinking, have I learned anything? Uh, how much of this is a part of my life? Go ahead and answer. First, uh, chapter 10, we're starting into. By the way, chapters and verses are absolutely arbitrary. So don't take it that when we give a new chapter, we're starting something new. Uh, the, the bishop put, put the chapters and, together, and, uh, well, also the priest to put the verses, number the verses. Uh, that was... It was not done according to understanding. I'll put it like that. <laughs> Go ahead. After this, the Lord appointed 72 others whom he sent ahead of him in pairs to every town 
and place he intended to visit. Okay, by the way, some of your uh, translations have 70. This has the two, two in brackets. Uh, some, uh, some manuscripts have 70, some have 72, which I find interesting because, uh, okay, you know what this stands for, don't you? Seventy. Yes, yeah, seventy. But what does what is called the seventy? The Septuagint. And what's the Septuagint? Okay. That's the the, the Bible that was. Mm. Uh, or the. At the Jewish Bible? Uh, no. Uh, about 250 BC, or the middle of somewhere around the middle of the third century BC, uh, the Hebrew sacred tradition was. Uh, the 70 or 72 elders, notice the 70 or 72 elders uh, translated the Hebrew into the Greek. So when you see this in your notes, that's referring to the Greek version of the scriptures. And that is um, the sacred tradition that Jesus and the apostles and Paul quote from. Remember, the New Testament was written in what language? Latin. Pardon? Latin. Greek. Greek. The Old Testament is written in Hebrew, Aramaic, and Greek. The New Testament, all in Greek. And the Latin was not... That explains it. <laughs> it's Greek to you. <laughs> it was Greek to St. Augustine because he's read only Latin. <laughs> no, uh, the Latin did not come until about what time? Uh, do you know when uh, St. Jerome was translating the Latin, uh, the, well, he translated the Greek, uh, Old Testament and New Testament, though he conferred, he could read Hebrew and conferred with uh, the Hebrew scriptures. Do you know when he did this? Not until... Well, I think 384 is the three, uh, sort of the final time, but in the mid to the late fourth century. Notice, 300 years after the ascension, we haven't even reached 300 years in this country. I think it's hard to realize how long the church was a Greek church. That's, that's the reason we have so many Greek words in the liturgy. Liturgy is a Greek word. Eucharist is a Greek word. Kyrie eleison, Christe, that's Greek. Uh, and so, I'm glad I I'm glad I chased this rabbit. The, the, the difference in the languages wasn't that how Protestants determined that certain books in, in the Old Testament were because they weren't originally written in they were originally <coughs> written in Hebrew and Arabic. And so the, if they were found in Greek, they weren't the official uh, there were there were two reasons. Uh, the uh, first of all the Jews did not have a Bible until when? When 
Jesus was on earth in human form, that was not a Bible. That was a sacred tradition and it was fluid. Question? And uh, so not until around this time, give or take, did the Jews, uh, the, do you know what the, uh, we call it, the canonized. Do you know what canon means? It's official. Pardon? It's official. Uh, it, official, but it's that, uh, it's that by which all else is measured. It's a measuring stick, a uh, measuring rod. So when somebody's canonized, a saint, okay, that's, uh, they have reached the mark that they can be called <coughs> holy, an example for people to follow. Uh, yes? Go ahead. The canon, it's, the canon is what we call, or what the church calls the Bible. What do you mean that before they had it written down that it was fluid? I mean, I know what that means in my sense, but if these if these traditions have been passed down from generation to generation, and I understand the old telephone game where you tell one person by the time it gets to the end, there's, it, it may be different. But in this sense, I guess I've always thought it wasn't so much fluid, or maybe I'm thinking of this differently, that if these stories were this, Pretty much the same the whole way through. Um, yes and no. Uh, first of all, that isn't what I meant by fluid, but I'm going to come back to that. Okay. By fluid, I mean uh, there was no set number of, of books that were part of the okay. uh, sacred tradition. There was a great variety, and depending on where you lived, uh, then one group in Alexandria. Egypt, which was a major center. Uh, you had one group and one way of interpreting in Palestine, you had another group and another way of interpreting. So that's what I meant by all, uh, everything was fluid, there was nothing set. But coming back to the text, one of the reasons uh, you'll notice Sometimes translations that are so different is because the the first probably the first two somewhere between the first two to three hundred years that was a time when most of the errors were made in copying manuscripts of the New Testament. Do you know why? It's done by hand. It was done by hand, but it continued to be after that. What was the difference between that early time and the later time? Some were going from memory and, and writing it down, whereas... Certainly at the beginning, they were going from memory, so different memories. Well, and different purposes and different audiences. That's the reason we have the four. Uh, but uh, later, say by the fourth century, you had professional scribes that is copyists, the monks were professionals. Then you have copies that are more, but uh, not until around 400 BC do you have the first five books in more or less the way we have them now. So one of the reasons we have similar stories and they've been put together in a way and Sometimes they don't quite fit. It's because there were different traditions being put together. So uh, when we think about, okay, the Bible is said, it's exactly what God, oh my goodness, it's exactly what God gave us and, you know, it was written down. That's not the case. But I'm sorry, I am going to have to go pretty quickly because we have to go to the morn this afternoon <laughs> and we have to be there by two. <laughs> so uh, we will pick up, why don't we begin at uh, chapter 10. <coughs> and if, if you would like, I 
I will be glad to talk more about this. I love to, I love to talk about it, by the way. <laughs> See you next week and have a good rest of the week. As I'm going to lock the door now, you can get out. You just have to. Hey, here they are. When the last person or persons out, please push both of the